One of the longest stories in the Quran is the story of Joseph. And you know I had to compare it to the one in the Bible. The Bible and the Quran share a lot of different characters. That leads us to Joseph, a classic patriarch found both in the Bible and the Quran. And the two stories are shockingly similar and have a very similar plot overall. Here, let me give you the rundown of what I mean. In both recordings, Joseph had dreams, his brothers were jealous of him and plotted to kill him. One brother spoke up to help spare his life, Joseph was picked up by a caravan. The brothers told their fathers that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Joseph ended up gaining honor in the sight of those in Egypt after being taken there by the caravan. Women found him handsome. A married woman endeavored to seduce Joseph. He fled her seduction. The lady blamed Joseph of evil. Eventually, he wound up in prison. He interpreted two dreams that prisoners shared with him. This helped gain Joseph honor, uh, enough honor to stand before the king and interpret the king's dream, which once after interpreting the king's dream, he was made basically second in command over all of Egypt. Joseph helped save Egypt from starvation and oversaw the land. Joseph's family came to Egypt for food. Joseph tests his brothers to see if they are still selfish or if they have grown in godliness since tossing him into a, a well to get picked up by a caravan. And finally, at the end, Joseph is reunited with family and praises God. Sounds like they're practically the same story, but the small differences throughout are noticeable and do impact how people may interpret the story. And I'll point out four in this video. The first one, the coat of many collars. Jacob favors Joseph from the get-go, it would seem. He gives Joseph a coat of many collars, and this act causes his brothers to sort of despise him and be jealous of how much the father loves Joseph. It also doesn't help that Joseph later on goes on to share his dreams and visions from God about his family bowing down to him, which causes his brothers to further resent Joseph. In the Quran, there is no mention of a coat of many colors, although it is mentioned that Joseph's brothers noticed that Jacob's father really loved Joseph. But it seems like the implied reason for why the brothers are so hateful and deceitful is because they're following after Satan, the evil one, as implied in verse 5 of Surah 12. It seems more like the emotional disconnect between the brothers and their father has more to do with their evil shenanigans than it does to do with father's favoritism of Joseph. From an interpretation standpoint, the Bible seems to insinuate that Jacob's favoritism and Joseph's propensity to boast a bit helped cause further division within the family. It seems like we're supposed to take away that family favoritism is not a good thing and can cause a lot of headaches and problems. It also may be subtly hinted at within the scriptures that polygamy isn't the best idea because Jacob's two favorite children, Joseph and Benjamin, within the biblical account, were given birth to by Rachel, his favorite wife. And this sort of favoritism really caused a divide within the family. But the Quran account seems to really paint Joseph and Jacob in an even better light than the Bible does. Even though the Bible does make Joseph and Jacob appear to be the good guys, for lack of a better term, the Quran really seems to try to wipe them clear of any sort of blame whatsoever. There's even a point that after the brothers try to get rid of Joseph by tossing him into the well in the Quran account, that they tell their father that wolves ate him. Jacob doesn't believe them and knows the intentions of their heart, according to the verse 18. So from an interpretation standpoint, it seems like the emphasis of the Quran is more about choice. You can either choose to fall Satan in evil and deceit and be cursed for it or suffer consequences, or you can follow Allah and do what's right and be blessed for it, as Jacob and Joseph later are. The second big difference I noticed was the point of the seduction. In both accounts, in the Quran and the Bible, the master's wife, the master of Joseph, after being sold to Egypt, tried to seduce Joseph. Now, in both accounts, Joseph resists the seduction, but the way he refuses and also the way he ends up in prison differ. And I'll explain how. In the biblical account, Joseph is perceived to be extremely handsome by all the women, and that includes his master's wife. His master's wife tries to get Joseph to sleep with her, and he responds like this. Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? But the master's wife did not give up easily. She it was a woman of prestige and power, presumably, and wanted to get the last say. 
So at one point, while Joseph was working by himself, she basically caught him by his garments and said, lie with me. But instead of sleeping with her, Joseph ran out of the room, leaving behind his outer garments in the hand of his master's wife. She then ends up accusing him of attempted rape. The master believes her and is utterly angry with Joseph, having him sent to prison in disgrace. This differs from the story told in the Quran. And the setup is rather similar. The master's wife tries to bolt Joseph within a room and get him to sleep with her. And he responds like this. God forbid, my master has been good to me. Wrongdoers never prosper. And that sounds rather similar to what the Bible said, but then the verse afterwards adds a little bit to it. She made for him and he would have succumb succumbed to her if he had not seen evidence of his Lord. We did this in order to keep evil and indecency away from him for he was truly one of our chosen servants. So the Quran explicitly mentions that Joseph would have given in to her seduction if it weren't for the evidence shown to him about Allah. It's just interesting to note that this is explicitly mentioned. Then like the biblical account, Joseph ends up running from the scene. And while running away, the master's wife grabs onto his coat and it comes off. But it's different in result. So when the master comes back and finds out about what happened, he's told to check whether or not it was pulled off from the back or from the front. If it was pulled off from the front, Joseph attempted rape or some sort of sexual act on her. If it's pulled off from the back, it means that he was running away and therefore he's innocent. Since it was pulled off from the back, he blames his wife for lying and tells her to repent. So how did Joseph wind up in prison in the Quranic account? Well, the master's wife didn't necessarily give up at this point. Her name was being run through the mud or other women in the area weren't exactly respecting her anymore. So to prove to them why Joseph is so desirable, she has them all gather around and invites Joseph out to meet them basically. And upon walking out, when the ladies set their eyes on Joseph, they pull out knives and slice their hands and they shout out, Great God, he cannot be mortal. He must be a precious angel. The women thought he was so handsome that he was like an angel among men. Using this as vindication for her actions earlier, the master's wife then says, See, this is why I want to sleep with him. And if he doesn't do what I want, I will have him cast into prison. And again, it mentions about how Joseph would have given in to their temptation, but he prayed to Allah saying, take me to prison. I'd much rather go there than to give in to this temptation of sexual sin. So Joseph then ends up going to prison in an honorable way because everyone knows that he went there to remain righteous. Just like the kind of the first point, the Bible and the Quran both paint Joseph in a favorable light. However, the Bible doesn't seem to paint Joseph in as much of a favorable light within the story itself. So as the reader, there's some sort of dramatic irony going on here. We all know that Joseph is innocent, but the people within the story don't know that. The people within the story think Joseph is a sinful man who attempted to make moves on the master's wife. The only people that know that he's innocent is the reader, God, and the lying wife. So he goes to prison in shame. Which seems to imply that even if you do the right thing and do what's righteous, you may not always be blessed immediately in the future. There may still be bad things happening to you even though you do good things in the present moment. But as we'll see in the biblical account, Joseph is still blessed, but not nearly as immediately or with as much honor to start. The Quran seems to avoid any shame on Joseph's behalf. There seems to be this implication that if you do what is righteous, you will gain honor and prestige, and eventually you may gain wealth and other things as well as Joseph did. But if you do evil, or you do what doesn't please Allah, you will gain shame and dishonor. At least, this seems to be the general premise going on throughout this story. The third difference I notice is what I will call Judah's redemption. I need to make clear, within the biblical account of Joseph's story, it is much more specific within the brothers' stories, the brothers who ended up betraying Joseph. The Bible names different brothers within Joseph's story. The Quran, on the other hand, does not name any specific brothers at any point, not at least that I came across. So this impacts how the story sort of ends. In both accounts, the brothers end up coming to Egypt for food because there's a famine going on, and they request food from Joseph. But the thing is, they don't know that Joseph is the man they're requesting food from. Joseph ends up testing them to see if they're still selfish people who are willing to throw their brother into a well, 
or to see if they have changed and repented and are no longer living the sort of lifestyle they were living in the past. And following the series of tests, he ends up finding out that they are changed people. Now, the difference lies in the fact that within the Bible, there's one character and specifically who really has a turning point, and his name is Judah. Within the beginning of Joseph's story, Judah is one of the brothers that really advocates against Joseph when they have him thrown into the well. He really wants Joseph to be killed. He also ends up trying to go out and sleep with a prostitute who happens to be his daughter-in-law. She gets pregnant. It's, it's a whole story. All that to say, Judah in the beginning of the story is not a great guy. But by the end, he is the one who personally advocates to stay in Egypt so the rest of his brothers can go home back to their father when Joseph threatens to detain the youngest brother because he happens to be the father's favorite and he knows it. But instead of letting that happen, Judah tries to sacrifice his own life and lay down his own freedom for the sake of the freedom of his brothers, especially his youngest brother, and also to spare his father who is heartbroken over the fact that his youngest brother wouldn't come back. But in the Quran account, even though similar events take place, where one of the brothers offers to stay in the place of the youngest, there are no specific names or really specific story arcs to follow the brothers are always just one collective group. So what does this mean from an interpretation standpoint? It would appear that the Bible makes the story much more personal. There can be personal transformation within a person's life, while the Quran isn't quite as personal in its approach. Yes, the brothers change and they repent and they become godly by the end, but there's not really a personal connection with one individual or any individual. It is a group effect. And finally, the fourth part is the ending. The story of Joseph within the Quran ends with Joseph reuniting with his family and praising God. And then afterward, Muhammad talks about how this is an accurate account of what happened, even though he's telling it thousands of years later. And he makes sure that the reader understands his prophethood. This doesn't appear within the Bible. And this would make sense for a couple reasons. The style that the Bible was written in was a lot different than the Quran. But secondly, Moses, who is believed to have written Genesis, where the story of Joseph can be found in the Bible, would have only been a few generations down from when the story took place. So the need to express the accuracy of the story since it would have been closer to his time seems less relevant versus someone who would be telling a story that was supposed to happen thousands of years before they were even alive. So instead, after Joseph reunites with his family and worships God, there's this telling of socioeconomic and political events that happened after Joseph's reign, which establishes how the Jews became so prominent within Egypt at that time, which sets up for the book of Exodus that follows Genesis within the Bible about why the Egyptians feared the Jews and then eventually enslaved them. So those are the major differences between the Quran and the Bible as far as the story of Joseph is concerned, and some of their interpretational implications or at least how some people may interpret them differently. Let me know down in the comments down below if you know of any differences that I missed or anything you may disagree with from an interpretation standpoint. Let me know. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and share it with a friend. And as always, before I close out, friends, go out there and light the world yourselves.